Well, he was in jail. He was incarcerated for doing the right thing. He was imprisoned because he was living for Jesus and telling others about Jesus Christ. He was living in a time of political turmoil, of economic ups and downs, a really, really hard time. And so here this guy is. His name is Paul. It's 2,000 years ago. He's the guy who was named Saul before he became a Christian. God gave him a new name, Paul. He followed Jesus. He lived the right way. And he ends up right in the middle of jail in a tough situation. Sometimes that happens even when you do things right. And that's what happened to Paul. And so when we look at his story, uh, we discover that as he writes this book of Philippians and, and this wonderful little book in the Bible, just four chapters long, filled with joy and passion and peace. These four little chapters that just, that just ooze with a sense of contentment and the presence of Jesus are written in one of the most difficult times ever, a great book of the Bible for us to be studying right now as a congregation. Because we're in a time that has political challenges, economic challenges, and you're not in jail, but some people are locked in their homes. <laughs> you feel kind of stuck. And so I think we can relate with the Apostle Paul. And what we discover in the book of Philippians is that the Apostle Paul is walking on the pathway of peace. He's walking, following Jesus, walking in a way that he can stay in peace even in a tough situation. So we discover that the Apostle Paul is rejoicing. He's walking in joy. And when he walks in joy, he finds peace even when he's in jail, even in a time of turmoil. You can find that same kind of peace. When you're ready to rejoice, even in the tough times, we discover that the Apostle Paul in this, in this pathway of peace is growing in gentleness. Even though he can be frustrated and angry, there's this gentle spirit. You can grow in gentleness, and so can I. And when we do, we walk the pathway of peace. The Apostle Paul declares in Philippians chapter 4, the Lord is near. As he walks in this time of turmoil, he walks side by side with Jesus. He knows he's not alone. He knows that Jesus is with him. He knows that God is on the throne. And so he has peace as he walks because he knows the Lord is near. He says, I'll have no anxiety about anything. He says, I might be concerned. I might have to work a little harder. I may have to sort this out. But anxiety is not going to take over my life because God's on the throne of my life. And you can do that and so can I. We can say to anxiety, this is not your home. My heart is not your home. And I'm not going to live in anxiety. That's part of the way that you walk the pathway of peace. And then the Apostle Paul prays. He says, on every occasion, with prayer and supplication, with, with petition to God, with thanksgiving, let God know your requests. He says, pray, 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 pray. So as the Apostle Paul is walking this pathway of peace, he's talking to God, he's crying out to God, he's asking for God's help for himself and others, and he finds the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we can do that. You and I can pray and talk to God in the toughest of times. And we will find peace. That's the pathway of peace. And Paul's walking that pathway. And then Paul was experiencing the power of peace. And so can you. The apostle Paul is walking in this, in this confidence and this strength. People are looking at him and saying, he should be breaking down. He should be falling apart. He should be saying, I can't do this anymore. But he's standing strong in the power of peace. And, and hear me, so can you. You can find strength in these days and weeks and months of uncertainty. In this time of economic upheaval and political tension. And maybe for some of you, sort of a sense of spiritual dryness. And yet God says, I want to come to you. I want to fill you. 
And I wanna, I wanna give you my power in this season. So the Apostle Paul and we can walk the pathway of peace. We can experience the power of peace. But I wanna ask you a question. Have you ever experienced the products of peace? What comes out of peace? You see, Paul identified the products of peace and you can see them grow in your life. In this book of Philippians, over and over, the Apostle Paul doesn't just show the pathway of peace. He doesn't just show the power that comes when we live with peace, but he shows you things happen in you, in your life, in your home, in your family, in your heart. When you walk in the peace of Jesus Christ, there are products, things that God grows in you and brings in you that you may not get any other way than going through a tough time and walking the pathway of peace. And so today, in this time of turmoil in our world, we're going to look at four different lessons that the Apostle Paul teaches, four of the things that God produces in us and produces through us when we walk the pathway of peace. These are what I call the products of peace. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God can bring good and amazing things out of really hard times? Well, if you walk with Jesus for any length, you know it's true. I mean, nobody wants that. Nobody says, God, bring me some tough times so you can grow my character or change my life or make me more like Jesus. Nobody says, God, bring tough times. And we shouldn't pray for that. But when the tough times come, it's amazing how often those are the moments Those are the very times that God does something, that God produces something, a product of God's work in us during the tough times. God doesn't cause the tough times, but God can work in you and me during the difficult times. And so I want to pause and I want to pray and I want to ask God to use this difficult time to do things in us that might have never happened before. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And we know, Jesus, we who follow you, we who call you Savior, That the greatest gift that we ever received in our lives is a gift that came through the most difficult time you ever experienced. Jesus, you hung on a cross and you took our sins and you bore our shame and you took our place and our punishment out of love for us. The most painful moment in in the history of humanity, Jesus, was when you hung on the cross and said, Daddy, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, Jesus, out of that painful moment, you have given us life. You have given us hope. You've cleansed us of our sins. You've called us your children. You've given us an inheritance in heaven that will never fail and never fade. And so, Jesus, we know that through hard things, you can bring good things. And so we pray that in this difficult, challenging season. You will bring the products of peace and your presence and your power in our lives. Let us not miss this moment, but do what you want to do in us, even though it's difficult and painful. Grow us to be more like Jesus. We pray this in his name. And everybody at home, wherever you are, everyone said, amen. Amen. Let's talk about this. Let's think about this. There's there's four different things that happen when we walk in peace in our lives that that are talked about in Philippians. There's more than four. We're going to just look at four this morning. And here's the first one. When we walk in peace, relationships grow beautifully deep. When we walk in the peace of Jesus, in gentleness and in prayerfulness, when we walk in the peace of Jesus, there's something that happens in our relational world. Relationships grow beautifully deep. Now, you have to understand the Apostle Paul. He's an interesting guy. He had kind of two primary backgrounds vocationally. He was a scholar, and he was a construction guy. He he really was. He was a scholar. He was trained by some of those brilliant minds of his day. And generally speaking, and I don't mean to uh, generalize, but let me generalize, a lot of scholars aren't known for their tender emotional sensitivity. They operate kind of cerebrally. A lot of scholars just think things through, and they don't always feel things. The Apostle Paul has a scholarly mind, but he's also a construction worker. He was a tent maker. He built homes. In those days, a lot of homes were tents. He he built kind of mobile homes, I guess. And the Apostle Paul had this, so he's a construction guy, also not always known for being super tender, and he's a scholar. And yet, as he walks in the peace of Jesus, As he lives for Jesus, his heart for people becomes tender and soft and beautifully deep. Look with me at Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 
through 11. And as I read these words, as you follow along, and if you're at home, wherever you are at home, if you're with friends, if you're on the road traveling somewhere, if you have a Bible, if you're in a hotel room, see if they got a Gideon's Bible stuck in the drawer right there. Pull it out if you can. Turn to Philippians. We're looking at four different passages today. If you're at home, open your Shoreline app. And you can take some notes here. Uh, Wherever you are, let's open God's word on your phone, in a Bible, or look on the screen and follow along. But notice the tenderness of heart that comes through this passage. The Apostle Paul, the scholar construction worker, writes these words. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And there's a tenderness there. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel... All of you share in God's grace with me. We're bound together in this. Listen to this now, verse eight. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? He says, I long for you with the heart and the affection of Jesus Christ. And then he goes into this prayer that grows out of this tender heart. And he says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I love that. Out of this tender heart and care, he goes to this deep place of prayer. Our affections deepen for others when we walk close to Jesus and we walk the pathway of peace and live in the power of peace. One of the products of peace is a a tender, affectionate heart. And I need to tell you, uh, when I became a follower of Jesus, I was 16 years old and I was just a self-centered kid. I thought of virtually no one but myself, but the more I walk with Jesus, the more I walk in the presence of Jesus and the peace of Jesus and the power of Jesus, my Tenderness and affection for people changes. My relationships change. And I need to just speak to Shoreline Church for a minute. I wish you were all right in this room with me, but you're not. You're scattered all over the place. But will you hear my heart as a pastor? And I'm going to speak for myself and for all of your Shoreline staff. Um, We love the congregation of Shoreline Church. We are so blessed by your faithfulness by the privilege we have to serve you and serve this community and world with you, side by side with you. And I've got to tell you, in the last about week and a half, I've had about 50 to 60 personal interactions with many of you. And some of you who are listening are going to know I'm talking about you because you sent me an email and I responded back to you. And some of us have gone back and forth and just interacted about some things in your life and the life of the church. Many of you I talked to on the phone and I've been having conversations and I just, I've been calling people and I start with these words, how are you doing? And many of you just share your hearts, some of the challenges financially, some of the challenges right now in in kind of finding meaning in a time where you're sort of locked into your house and you shared your hearts with me and with many of other staff members and our our leadership team members. You're sharing your hearts. And and, and I've loved this church since the day God called me here. But my love for this church and our staff's love for this church continues to grow even through this tough season, maybe particularly in this tough season. And one of the things that has blown me away as, as I've called many of you to say, how are you doing? Before we're done talking, most of you have said something like this to me. You've said, Pastor, how are you doing? How's your family? And that has touched my heart. And I've told many of you how my family's doing, how I'm doing. Um, and I not only feel an affection for you, but I feel your affection for me as a pastor. And it means so much. And so I look at the Apostle Paul, and he's growing in tenderness of heart because he's walking in the peace of Jesus. And I look and go, man, that's, that happens. It's happening in my heart. I hope it's happening in your heart. You're growing in that tenderness and that affection. And, and then what we see is the Apostle Paul, as his heart tenderizes, as he cares more, his prayers change. He prays with this fresh faith and this vision and this confidence And he lifts up God's people. I I love this prayer in Philippians chapter one, beginning in verse nine. Paul says this, he says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. I mean, that's my prayer for Shoreline. Jesus, this is my prayer for Shoreline, that their love may grow more and more. May it abound and grow in knowledge and depth of insight. I pray for each person listening from wherever they are right now. Grow their love. Grow their knowledge of you. 
grow their love for you and let it overflow to others. And then the apostle Paul prays so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Jesus, I pray for Shoreline Church that you would make your people pure and blameless. Jesus, none of us are there. There's days we don't even feel close, but God, bring your purifying power in us. Make us blameless. First of all, blameless because we put our faith in Jesus and you've washed us clean. But also let us live lives that look more and more like Jesus. And then Paul prays that you'd be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I pray that you would fill every one of us with the fruits of righteousness. That we would live more right in our behavior. We would think in the right ways. We'd be motivated by the right things. That the righteousness, the right lives that you want us to live would come alive in our hearts. And especially in, these, in the season where we are slowing down a little bit by, just by virtue of where our culture is at. Let us not slide into behaviors of selfishness and unrighteousness and unholiness, but Lord, let us search our hearts and say, make me more like Jesus, more pure, more blameless, more righteous, through faith in him, but also through walking with him with every passing day. We pray this for his glory. Amen. So here's the question. What's my next step? What's your next step? And how about if we just declared this together? I will express my affection and pray more often. I want to ask you, wherever you are, if you're by yourself or with a group of five or six family members that, that, that live in your home, will you, will you declare these words with me? My next step, let's read this together. I will express my affection and pray more often. Will you do that? Will you feel affection for people and tell them, I love you. You mean so much to me. I care about you. I delight in you. Express your affection and then pray for people. Pray quietly on your own. Pray with them. Maybe even when the service is over. If you're, if you're with somebody else, just say, you know, we haven't prayed together in a day, in a week, in a month, ever. But can I pray for you and pray for the power of God in your life? I will express my affection and pray more often. Here's the second thing that happens when we walk in peace that the Apostle Paul unfolds in the book of Philippians. When we walk in peace, we shine the light of Jesus in example and expression, in our actions and in our words, in how we live and in what we say. When we walk in peace, we shine the light of Jesus in example and expression. Look with me at Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Remember, the Apostle Paul is in jail. He's been incarcerated for following Jesus. And he writes this, verse 12, Philippians 1. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's saying, the fact that I got thrown in jail has pushed the message of Jesus forward. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. How did they know that? How did they all know he was in chains for Christ? Take a wild guess. How did they all figure this out? Paul told them, <laughs> I'm here because I love Jesus. I'm in chains because I follow Jesus Christ. And I love what he says. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else. Everyone heard the story of Jesus. In the ancient world, oftentimes they would chain a prisoner to a guard. Could you imagine being chained to the apostle Paul for your eight-hour shift? You think you're not going to hear a little bit about Jesus and how much God loves them? So people heard the story of Jesus. And then verse 14. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters, the other Christians, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul says, not only am I being bold with my faith, but other Christians, when they see how I'm living my life, while persecuted, while in jail for doing the right things and still loving Jesus and speaking about him and being an example of his grace, other people are having their mouths open to share and their lives open to serve in a way that shows the presence and the glory of Jesus. Our actions show that Jesus is alive. Are you living in a way, are your actions giving evidence to and witness to the presence of Jesus Christ? Pray that they will and look for ways to live that will show that Christ is alive. Actions of compassion, of generosity. Boy, in this season right now, 
you're, you're, you're going to go out shopping and you contact two or three neighbors and say, hey, listen, I'm going shopping. I know you're not getting out much. Can I buy you something? And they give you a few items to get. And you pick them up and you get them. And when you come back, you give them to them. And you sanitize them first and you kind of give them, put a bag on their porch and they say, well, what do I owe you? And maybe you say, you know, I know times are tight for all of us, but you don't owe me anything. I'm just glad to serve. And those are actions. And then our words come along with it. Maybe they say, well, why? Why are you that way? Say, oh, because I know someone who's given me everything in the universe, including his own life. And, and I want to be like him. Who's that? His name's Jesus. Tell your story. Show the story of Jesus and then tell the story of Jesus. Our hearts become more confident. Our words become more clear and more bold. We don't shove things down people's throats. We don't impose Jesus on anybody because he doesn't do that. But we're ready to share the story and talk about our changed lives. Jesus did that. And he called you and me to live that way. So we live that way. But we do it out of who we are. We do it organically. Before I was a Christian, my sister Gretchen, I've mentioned her before. My sister Gretchen had become a Christian. She was the first one in our family, of, of an extended family of over 100 people. There was only one Christian until Gretchen became a Christian. That doubled the Christians in our family to two. And, and, and when Gretchen became a Christian, she began to show me Jesus, and she began to talk about Jesus. But my sister Gretchen is just a very shy person. She didn't get in my face and shove things down my throat. But she served me. She cared for me. Even when I was brutally mean to her, she just kept loving me. And when I'd ask her, Gretchen, why do you do that? Why do you care? Why are you helping with my chores? Why are you trying to be nice to me? She would just say, because I know Jesus and I love Jesus. In her own way, she'd let me know it was all about Jesus. She just did it in her own quiet, gentle way. When I became a Christian, I started to talk about Jesus to others out of who I am. And I'm a more direct, blunt kind of a guy. And my little brother, Jason, who was not a Christian, for many years, I shared with him, and he was actually kind of a resistant, pushback kind of a guy when it came to the Christian faith. And I would just find, I, was, I would give him books to read because he was very intellectual, very bright. I gave him books to read, uh, a book, Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands the Verdict, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. He read a bunch of different books. And I told him one time, you can fly, I lived in Michigan at the time, you can fly out to Michigan, I'll pay for you to come to Michigan and hang out, but you need to know if I pay for you to fly out here, we're gonna talk about Jesus. He said, I'll take a free trip. And we talked a lot about Jesus. Not pushy, but just honest. And he'd disagree and we'd debate. But today, because my sister Gretchen tenderly and gently showed Jesus and talked about Jesus, I know the Savior. And because I boldly and strongly debated with my brother and, and shared about my life and talked about Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit, he's now a follower of Jesus a beautiful Christian wife, five kids who love Jesus, and he not only teaches in a public school, but he also leads worship in a local church. That's what God does when we just live out our faith. Because when we walk the pathway of peace, like the Apostle Paul in jail, we can show Jesus and we can talk about Jesus. We can tell his story. So what's your next step? How about this? I will look for more opportunities to show and share the love and the grace of Jesus. Now, again, you may be home alone or home with a group, but I want to challenge you right now to say these words with me. My next step, let's say it together. I will look for, the, for more opportunities to show and share the love and grace of Jesus. Find ways to do that. We've got a wonderful little tool for you on the Shoreline app. It's called the Romans Road. And we're going to put that right where you can find it real quickly. If you've never downloaded the Shoreline app, you're at home right now, you got time, do it today. And then look over the Romans road. It's just walking through key Bible passages in the book of Romans that walk you through the whole story of the gospel. I remember one time I was sitting in a, in a restaurant called Cafe San Juan. It won't surprise you, a place that had salsa and chips. And, and the guy who owned his name was Jim. He'd been a Golden Glove boxer. He had a couple of kids and his wife, B, just a sweet couple. And I'd go there to study sometimes and I'd just sit in kind of a little corner booth. It was a small place. I'd sit and study. And sometimes Jim would come and sit by me and ask me questions about what I was studying, about the message I was preparing. He was kind of a, kind of a cultural Catholic. He put, what that meant is he was so Catholic, he would send his kids to Catholic stuff, but he wouldn't go. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but for some folks, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's like, uh, I'm Catholic enough to send my kids. That's kind of where he was at. 
But I remember one time he started asking me about faith and about what I believed about Jesus. And we just kind of opened the door. I said, I said, Jim, can I walk you through some passages? I said, you know, as a Catholic, I said, you're obviously a very devout Catholic. And I said, as a Catholic, um, I said, you, we got pretty much the same Bible. We both have this book called Romans in our Bibles. Can I open? I opened to Romans and I'd highlighted the passages that you'll find on the Shoreline app. I'd highlight them in each passage. I'd highlight it and I'd say, turn to the next passage right in the margin of my Bible. So I just turned my Bible around. I said, Jim, I said, would you just read this to me? And we, we, read, we read verse by verse through the Romans road. And he read them to me. I said, what do you think that means? What do you think that means with each passage? I didn't point a finger and tell him. I said, he'd read the passage. I said, what do you think that means? And you know, he got it. It wasn't that, it wasn't that confusing. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? Oh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin, the cost of sin is death. What do you think that means? I, it wasn't complicated. So he walked me through the Romans road by reading the passages and talking to me about it. And then that took him one more step towards Jesus. So the second thing that happens when we walk the pathway of peace is we have a new boldness to show the story of Jesus and to speak the story of Jesus. And I encourage you to look for opportunities to do that. And then number three, when we walk in peace, our perspective and perseverance expand. When we walk in the peace of Jesus, our outlook and our perspective and our strength to persevere and hang in there, they get stronger. You're gonna see that in this passage. Look with me at Philippians 1, 21 to 26. The apostle Paul is talking about his life and his ministry, and I'll tell you right now, here's where he was at. He was weary, he was tired, he was discouraged, and he was so discouraged that he thought it would probably be easier if my life just ended and I could go be with Jesus. I don't think he was thinking about taking his own life, but he was saying, man, it'd be almost easier to just let this life end and be with Jesus. But he realized, Jesus put me here for a reason, and I need to live out that purpose. And so listen to what he says, and you'll you'll get this tone in the heart of the Apostle Paul. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 21. Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ, is to be like Jesus, and to die is gain. And that's actually true. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Then he says, if I am to go on living in the body, continue living this life, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I'm gonna work in this life. Yet what what, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. He's saying, man, if this is a hard choice, I desire to depart and be with Christ. That's far better. Now listen to this. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. I live this life. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Man, the Apostle Paul is walking through a very real battle. It's something I call a theology of life. That what is life about? And here's what the Apostle Paul says. He's saying, I've come to realize that to live in this life is to be like Jesus. He was in the glory of heaven. He had perfect peace and perfect glory. And he left all of that to come for us and to lay his life down for us. So to live like Jesus, to become more like Jesus, that's our theme for this whole year. Even in this crazy time, our theme is staying the same. More like Jesus, more like Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, for me, To be like Jesus is to live this life where I serve and sacrifice and help others and point them towards Jesus. It's hard. Man, it'd be easier just to be with Jesus. But to be here in this world is to be like Jesus and to serve Jesus. And so Paul just says, listen, that's what I'm going to do because that's what Jesus did for me and that's what Jesus did for you. So what's my next step? My next step is I will focus more intently on serving others instead of on my own pain and discouragement. And some of you are feeling pain today and discouragement in your life. But will you say these words with me out loud wherever you are? My next step, I will focus more intently on serving others instead of on my own pain and discouragement. I hope you meant those words as you said them. Because that's to become like Jesus. There's times where life is hard and it's painful and there's deep struggle and deep loss. But to be like Jesus is to hang in there and to keep pressing forward and to count the cost and to love others well and point them towards Jesus even when it's hard. Well, here's the fourth thing the Apostle Paul addresses. And now we turn to Philippians chapter four. 
verses 11 to 13. When we walk in peace, contentment grows and generosity flows. The Apostle Paul says, listen, when you walk with Jesus, when you walk in his peace and his strength and his power, contentment, I'm okay, I'm gonna be all right, that grows. And generosity, let me help you be all right. Let me share with you, that begins to flow. Look with me at Philippians 4, beginning in verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Wow. You know, the Apostle Paul is saying this. When I can say, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. I'm all right. I'll be fine. And we mean it. I don't need more. I don't need to take the next step. You know, I just, I, I, I'm content. When we can say I'm good, then we can become good to others because we know we're okay. Can I, can I be content right now with where I'm at? That's a good question to ask ourselves right now. Can I be content right now? If the markets don't change, can I be content? If I'm struggling in, relationally, can I be content? Me, not, not saying I'm, I'm glad this is happening, not saying I don't hope it doesn't change sometime, but can I learn right where I'm at with whatever I'm facing to say, you know what, Lord, you're with me. You're my stronghold. You're my mighty tower. You're on the throne. You love me. I'm forgiven from all my sins. Heaven is my home. Oh, wait, I'm okay. I have everything that really matters that lasts forever. Because here's the trick. If you can be content right now, you will still be content if you get more or if things get better. And if you can be content right now, you'll still be content if things get tougher and you have less. But if you're not content right where you are today, not if things change tomorrow, if you're not content right where you are today, you will not be content if you get more. And you will not be content if you have less. Because contentment is not about how much I have, it's about knowing who has me, who I belong to, who has saved me, who has given his life for me on the cross, and the one who has prepared heaven for me someday, and is with me now until that day comes. Am I content where I am right now? Can I say, I can do all this through him who gives me strength? What is all this? It's whatever you face. He will give me the power and the strength to press on. So what's my next step? I will focus on what I have and not what I don't have and pray for courage to share with joyful generosity. I want to dare you wherever you are. I want to challenge you from your heart to say these words with me. My next step, I will focus on what I have and not what I don't have and pray for courage to share with joyful generosity. When I say I'm good, I'm okay. Man, God's goodness can flow through me and through you also. That's what the Apostle Paul did. And I need to tell you right now, that's what your church staff is doing. About a week ago when we realized how challenging the economic realities were becoming, we went to all of our staff and we basically said, what, what do you need to get by? Because we want Shoreline to stay strong and stay afloat financially. And we know some of our people are going to be struggling. Some of our folks are stepping up and giving more right now because they can. But some of you right now, man, people in the food industries, people who own restaurants, people in the resort industries, it's kind of dried up. And we know, man, we're praying for you every day. And we love you and we're here for you. And Shoreline's gonna stay here being the church of Jesus Christ and serving you and our community. But when we realized what was going on, we asked our staff, what can you do to help to bring some of the expenses down for Shoreline? I'll tell you a couple things that happened. One thing that happened was that two of our staff members said, I'll keep working full time for no pay. That blew my mind. A bunch of other staff members said, I can take a cut of 10%, 20%, up to 50% for the time being. And if someday Shoreline can give that back, that's great, but, but we'll figure it out. But right now I can live on less. I'll do that. Some of our staff 
make an amount that is just enough to get by on. And they, they just, so we actually had staff members start to say, well, I can give some of my vacation time. So if we have somebody who has no work right now and they exhaust their vacation time, they can use some of my vacation time. And I think we've had between 400 and 500 hours of vacation time donated from staff for other staff who don't have any work right now. That's the heart of generosity in the leaders of your church. Because we love Jesus, we love you, this church, and we love our community, and we want to be here doing the work of Jesus. When we walk in the power of Jesus Christ and we walk the pathway he sets before us, contentment grows, I'm okay, and generosity flows, I can still share because I know who's on the throne. This is my prayer for you. As you walk into this new week, will you walk in the peace of Jesus? And will you experience the power of that peace? And then will you watch and pray that the products of peace and the behavior and actions of peace grow up in you and flow through you and touch the people in your home and when you encounter, and ultimately, when this is all over, that peace will overflow to the face of this world. Lord Jesus, that's our prayer today. Lord, we're in a strange time, but we worship the one who is the Prince of Peace. So calm our anxious hearts. Help us walk the pathway of peace. Help us experience the power that comes from your Holy Spirit when we live in peace. And God, we dare to ask, we boldly ask that you will show in us and through us these products of peace that will show the world that you are real, that will bring blessing to others. And we pray all of this for the glory of Jesus Christ and in his name. And everyone said, amen. Let me give you two words of encouragement as we close today. Number one, if you need prayer, we want to pray for you. We literally have a team of five people, five pastors and leaders sitting at phones waiting to pray for you. And here's what I know. You have things to be prayed for. So you see the number on the screen there. Get on, on your phone right now. Call right now. Just say, can you pray for this? And we will pray in the power of Jesus for whatever your need is for you or someone you love. Take time right now and let us pray for you. Or if you're online interacting uh, via the, the chat feature, just share your prayer need there and somebody will pray for you online right there on the, on the, on the chat feature. And here's the second thing. If you're new to Shoreline, some of you are just tuning in. Maybe you're in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. Maybe you're right in Monterey, but you, this is new being at Shoreline. You're online, but you're part of the church today. And you want to know more about the church. Just go to the website that you see there, info at Shoreline Church, and just tell us you visit us on the service, and we want to tell you about the church and just serve you in any way we can. So let us serve you by praying and by connecting and now let me finish this time by just giving a word of blessing as we close our time together. As you go on with your day, right where you are, may the amazing peace of Jesus Christ, a peace that passes all understanding, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Have a great day. And we will see you Monday, Wednesday, Friday with our devotions for you. And then we will also see you next Sunday in worship. And we'll let you know week by week, whether it's here or where you are. But God bless you. Have a great week.